Great to see you this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the little New Testament book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians is buried right in the middle of your New Testament. If you find the book of Hebrews, turn left. If you find the book of Romans, turn right and keep flipping a few pages and you'll find 1 Thessalonians. We're continuing our series called Letters from Heaven. We're opening the New Testament letters and we're looking to see what the Holy Spirit has to say to his church through these wonderful letters. While you're finding your way to Thessalonians chapter 2, let's talk about what happens when the enemy strikes back. What happens when the enemy strikes back? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and beginning in verse 1. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know that we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. Don't have time to read all of Paul's words in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, but I do want to resume it towards the end of the chapter. If you skip down to verse 17, let's pick up 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and resuming at verse 17. But brothers, when we were torn away from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did, again and again, but Satan opposed us. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Jumping into verse chapter 3. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. You know quite well that we were destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way, as you know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. Look at verse 6, our last verse. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come minister to us this morning. Father, I thank you for your word, which is alive and powerful, a two-edged sword that discerns the innermost thoughts and intents of our hearts. Your words not only uplift, they also admonish. Your words not only inspire, they also instruct. Your words not only encourage, but also correct our course. Thank you for every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. For all scripture is profitable for our training in righteousness. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come now and illuminate the word of God to us. I pray that you'd give us the ability to grasp and comprehend spiritual truths. I pray that you'd give us clarity of understanding that you would be actively present with deep conviction. Father, give us grace to receive your words of truth and life, I ask in the name of Jesus. If your heart agrees with that prayer, say amen. Just want to thank you for being patient. If my voice is a little scratchy this morning, just working my way through a little cold and sore throat, uh, feeling I feel fine. Uh, my voice is just uh, not quite up to par, so thank you for being patient this morning. Several weeks ago, I was deeply saddened by the news that after 40 years of ministry, my home church in Philadelphia was closing its doors forever on December 31st. Even though the writing was on the wall for quite a while, it was still very hard to hear. In its heyday, my home church was over 2,000 people strong. On Friday nights, people would arrive more than an hour before service began just to get a seat inside the sanctuary. There were Catholic nuns and priests there were hippies, there were hell's angels, there were people who know people. And we witnessed incredible healing miracles, deliverances, life transformations, while wave after wave of the Holy Spirit rolled over us. 
In my entire journey, I have to say, I've never found another congregation that was so immersed in the love of God as my home church. Harvest time is doing pretty good, catching up. We're not quite there yet, but my prayers were going to surpass them. In the end, the congregation dwindled down to just 30 people running a community food bank, not even holding worship services anymore. I want to tell you, a food bank is a beautiful thing, but it is no replacement for the life and the dynamism of the Holy Spirit in the midst of God's people. If a church rejects the Holy Spirit, if a church grieves the Holy Spirit, if a church resists the Holy Spirit, you know, God says my spirit won't always strive with men. If a church doesn't want it, there is nothing left for it but social activism that is very detached from the work of the gospel. As I think about the legacy of my home church, there's still a lot to celebrate. There is a tremendous amount of treasure in heaven because of the ministry of my church. The Holy Spirit made a living deposit in my life and in the lives of thousands of others, and we're out here now still passing that deposit along. A new church plant in my hometown started by an Assemblies of God minister, a friend to me and Pastor Nick, just took over that magnificent building debt free for a dollar. And they're redigging the wells of revival in that place through intercessory prayer. But still, it makes one pause and think about what can happen to a local church when the enemy strikes back. On Monday evening, I was home studying First and Second Thessalonians, and I was intending to go a completely different direction with these scriptures, and I reached up at about 11.25 in the evening to shut the light out, and the Holy Spirit started giving me a download of revelation from these scriptures. I started scribbling late into the night. Pastor Tate used to tease me. He used to say, Glenn, the Lord loves you more than me because many times the Holy Spirit just whoosh, give me a word all in one shot. So I scribbled on and went to sleep. And when I woke up Tuesday morning, I scribbled some more. I want to say that the word that I have to share with you is strong meat for the spiritually mature. And I pray that God will give you grace to receive it. Last week in chapter one, we saw the mighty breakthrough that happened when Paul brought the gospel to Thessalonica. Under Paul's apostolic anointing, the Thessalonians had a dynamic encounter with the word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. As Paul preached, the Holy Spirit was powerfully present to bring deep conviction. In just three weeks, God-fearing Greeks became Jesus freaks. It was a powerful moment of victory for the kingdom of God. One that was answered immediately by severe satanic opposition. You know, I like what Bishop Joseph Garlington says. He says, every inch of kingdom soil is contested, and it's true. From the very beginning, Satan has always opposed Jesus and his church. He has always hated the church, harassed, hindered, harmed the church. He has relentlessly attacked the church by provoking persecution from without and by inciting conflict within. Acts tells the story of how the first believers in Jerusalem faced severe satanic opposition. When the gospel spread to Samaria, Satan's opposition increased. As Pastor Nick always reminds us, new levels new devils. When the gospel spread to Cyprus, Satan's opposition increased. When the gospel spread to Turkey on the first missionary journey, Satan's opposition increased. When the gospel spread to Greece on the second missionary journey, Satan's opposition increased yet again. After the riot in Thessalonica, Paul fled at night for the sake of the new believers, but the satanic opposition continued. First in Second Thessalonians, the, the first two chapters are extremely important because they give us the earliest glimpse in the New Testament of how Satan works to destroy a local church from within. They show us what happens when the enemy strikes back. On Monday night, in the wee hours of the morning, the Holy Spirit gave me four things that I want to share with you today. When the enemy strikes back, first of all, when the enemy strikes back, what is his objective? What's his objective? 
When Satan wants to destroy a local church, his number one objective is to alienate the church body from their apostolic and congregational leaders, from their pastors, their elders, their deacons, their ministry leaders. Satan's objective is to cause a rift. It's to disenfranchise. It's to create a power struggle that results in permanently severed relationships. You know, usurping authority has been his M.O. from the very beginning. Satan tried to usurp God's authority in heaven. That didn't work out so well for him. But in the garden, he succeeded in usurping man's authority, and he keeps running the same plays over and over again. That is the only Super Bowl metaphor you'll get this morning. In chapters 2 and 3, Paul is contending for the affections of his congregation. After the riot forced him to leave the city at night, Paul went on to Berea and then on to Athens. From Athens, he sent Timothy back to the Thessalonians to strengthen and to encourage them. After a few months, Timothy caught up with Paul in Corinth, and he brought a mostly positive report, but it was mixed. The new believers were doing remarkably well in spite of the severe persecution that they were enduring but there was a powerful, subversive movement afoot in the church threatening to discredit Paul's ministry and to disaffect the congregation from him. In chapters 2 and 3, Paul identifies the source of the opposition as none other than Satan himself. In chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, Paul says, We were torn away from you. We tried to come back to you again and again, but Satan cut us off from you. In chapter 3, verse 5, Paul says, I was afraid that the tempter might have succeeded in tempting you and our efforts would have been useless. In chapter 2, verse 2, he says, We dared to preach the gospel to you in the face of strong opposition. That word opposition is interesting in Greek. It's the root word of our English word agony. And it describes the final contest between two runners to cross the finish line. Agony was the final kick of a runner in an effort to edge out his competitor for the win. And what Paul is saying is from the very beginning in Thessalonica, Satan was competing against Paul, trying to edge him out for control of the church. And no wonder... Paul's apostolic ministry had done serious damage to Satan's kingdom. Beloved, can I tell you, Satan hates churches that are alive. He hates churches that are winning souls. He hates churches that are persuading uncommitted God-fearers to become full-fledged Christ followers. He hates churches that are turning people away from idolatry to serve the true and the living God. He hates churches that are undoing all the damage that he's done in people's lives. His very name means the adversary. And he is the enemy of God, of God's son, and of God's people. He ferociously opposes the church. Beloved, never forget that Satan himself is behind the conflicts and the controversies that destroy local churches. The struggle is not against flesh and blood. The struggle is not between strong human personalities. The struggle is not between people with competing agendas. The struggle is not between people with differing ideas of church governance. Satan uses human agents to be sure, but ultimately behind the human conflicts is an all-out satanic assault against the authority and the anointing of the apostolic and congregational leaders that God has set in place. When the enemy strikes back, what's his objective? Second, when the enemy strikes back, whom does he employ? Whom does he employ? When Satan wants to destroy, listen, this is good preaching right here. When Satan wants to destroy a local church, he uses the closest willing accomplices that he can find. In chapters 2, verses 14, 15, 16, Paul talks about the human instruments through whom the satanic opposition came against the Thessalonian church. 
He said, you became imitators of God's churches in Judea. You suffered from your own countrymen the same thing that those churches suffered from the Jews. They killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. See, just as in Judea, the thing that made the satanic opposition especially disorienting to the Thessalonians was that it came through those who were closest to them. Your own fellow countrymen, your own people, your own kin, your own friends, your own fellow citizens, those who should have had your back turned their back on you. Those who should have stood in solidarity with you sold you out. Those who should have been on your side took sides against you. From these verses, we can glean a lot about who are Satan's accomplices. Who are Satan's accomplices? For one thing, they're people who are controlled by a religious spirit. They're people controlled by a religious spirit. They're eager to maintain the status quo. They don't like new initiatives, especially if the goal is evangelism. They despise prophecy and the moving of the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you, that was the downfall of my home church, which once moved so powerfully in the glory of God. They don't want to embrace any new move of God. They dislike the growth of the church, and they're threatened by it. They're not happy to see new people coming in. You know, every once in a while, I have people who have been with us through this whole journey, and they'll say to me, oh, Pastor Glenn, I went to second service on Sunday. I went to third service on Sunday. I went to Saturday night. I didn't know a single person there. And I say, yes, isn't that wonderful? That means that we're reaching people for Jesus. Who are Satan's accomplices? They're people with a controlling spirit. People who want to exert their own will. People who want things done their way. They know best. People who push pet projects, usually ones that sap talent and resources away from the priorities of the pastors. They promote their own personal ministries and agendas. Beloved, listen, and may God give you grace this morning. Even if an agenda is noble, if it is promoted and pushed in a way that usurps the authority of the leaders and disrupts the order of the house, it will quickly become a vehicle for Satan. The source of die vision is two or more competing visions. When a member refuses to submit his personal vision to the vision of the congregational leaders, the result is division, division. Who are Satan's accomplices? You doing all right this morning? It gets better at the end, I promise you. Just stay with me through this, all right? You know we always end with triumph because of Jesus. Who are Satan's accomplices? A third thing I see is they are people who are unsurrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ. They live in willful disobedience to Jesus, and that is an open door for the enemy. Beloved, listen, I'm not talking about struggling people. I'm talking about stubborn people, and there's a huge difference between struggling people and stubborn people. Their lives don't bear good spiritual fruit. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you travel over land and sea to win one single convert, and when you finally succeed, you make him into twice the child of hell that you are. Because they're unwilling to submit to Jesus' authority, they're also unwilling to submit to the authority of his church. They're unwilling to submit to apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers and elders, deacons, ministry leaders. Years ago, we took our men to a Promise Keepers event at Shea Stadium, the old stadium. And I'll never forget when Tony Evans stood up to the microphone and he opened with this line. The problem with today's generation of kids and teenagers is that their parents have an issue with authority from which they have never repented. Boom! It went out in Shea Stadium like a shockwave. And it's true. When the enemy strikes back, what's his objective? Whom does he employ? And third, how does he use his accomplices? Beloved, when Satan wants to destroy a local church, he uses his mouthpieces to cunningly undermine God's mouthpieces. In chapters 2 and 3, Paul is defending his ministry 
against all the false accusations that Satan's mouthpieces has brought against him. You know, Satan is also called the devil, the slanderer. Jesus said he is the father of lies. Lying is his native language. How do you know he's lying if he's moving his lips? He is the accuser of the brethren. And from these verses, we can glean a lot about how Satan uses his accomplices. For one thing, Satan's mouthpieces capitalize on every setback, every mishap, and every mistake in the local church. They seize upon every difficulty and problem, and they exaggerate them to make a case that God isn't with the leaders. In chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, You know that our visit to you was not a failure. The reason he wrote that is because Satan's mouthpieces were saying precisely that it was. Because of the riots that broke out. Because Jason and the others had to post a bond in front of the city council guaranteeing they wouldn't breach the peace. Because Paul had to flee the city under the cover of night. Because the Thessalonians were enduring severe persecution. Satan's mouthpieces were saying, you know, this whole thing is a colossal fail. Beloved, listen to me. Beware of people who have something to say about everything who pounce on everything that happens and make an issue of it. Many years ago, I shared this before, but many years ago, I was in the Whole Foods parking lot in Greenwich. It was called Fresh Fields back then. And Denise was in the store, and I was just sitting, looking out my windshield, and I saw a picture from the Lord in front of me. It was the sea. And in the sea were all these wooden pilings, you know, like the kind that they build a dock on. There were hundreds of them, and they were all exactly the same level. They were exactly even. Only I knew in my spirit that some of those pilings were planted firmly in the seabed, and some of them were just floating on the top of the water. And if you stepped on the ones that were firmly planted in the seabed, they would bear you up. They would hold up your weight. But if you stepped on the ones that were just bobbing in the water when your weight went on them, they'd tip and you'd just go into the drink. And I said, Lord, how do you tell the difference between them? And the Lord said to me, don't trust the ones that bob up and down every time there's a wave. How does Satan use his accomplices? Satan's mouthpieces capitalize on leaders' limitations and human weaknesses. You know, we don't really know what prevented Paul from returning to Thessalonica. It might have been that it was just too hot, too dangerous for him to return. The men who had stirred up the mob in Thessalonica followed him to Berea and then all the way to, uh, to Corinth. It, it might have very well been that if Paul were to return, his life would have been in danger. It might have been that Paul was physically ill. We know that that was an ongoing issue for him, and it was compounded by the many beatings he took for the sake of the gospel. It might have been that Paul was emotionally unwell. He writes very candidly that when he arrived in Corinth, he was weak and he was trembling with fear. Turns out apostles are human too. Prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers and deacons and ministry leaders are human too. In fact, God has a very long history of using very flawed and very weak people. Spoiled brats and stutterers and scaredy cats and insignificant shepherd boys. Whatever it was that prevented Paul from returning to them, Paul says it was directly a result of satanic opposition and Satan's mouthpieces in Thessalonica seized right on that and they exploited it. They accused Paul of being insincere and weak. Sure, he fled into the night and left Jason and the others holding the bag. He stirred up the pot, took up an offering, and vanished out of town. He himself was unwilling to bear the consequences of his own preaching, they said. Paul is defending himself against the damage of their words when he writes, we suffered, we were insulted in Philippi, yet we still dared to preach the gospel to you in spite of strong opposition. We were torn away from you. We tried to come back, but Satan opposed us. You know quite well we were destined for this. We told you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out just that way. How does Satan use his accomplices? Satan's mouthpiece is so subtle 
seeds of doubt. They drop little insidious comments that insinuate sexual misconduct or mishandling of money. They conjecture aloud that leaders have delusions of grandeur or that they're walking in doctrinal error. They plant the idea that leaders don't sincerely care about the people. Paul is defending himself against all of these damaging seeds when he writes, our message didn't spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. We loved you so much that we delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives because you became so dear to us. You know, the really tragic thing about Satan's mouthpieces is that often they are unwitting accomplices. Paul writes about them in chapter 2, verse 16. He says, they displease God. What's tragic is that in their crusades against church leaders, they often believe that they're doing God a favor. They think they're on God's side. They think they're on the side of truth, but what they're doing doesn't please God. It opposes him. It violates the order of his kingdom. It impedes his gospel. It damages his church. Solomon said, God hates six things, and the seventh is an abomination to him, one who sows discord among the brethren. Paul also says about Satan's mouthpieces, they oppose all men by preventing them from hearing the gospel and getting saved. Beloved, listen to me. May God give you grace. Those who stir up controversies and conflict in the church, they are not harmless. They are enemies of other men's destiny in Christ. When they lift their voice against leaders, they're opposing the corporate authority of the entire congregation, and they're obstructing the progress of every last individual. Paul wrote to the Romans, I urge you, brothers and sisters, mark those who cause divisions among you and put obstacles in your way. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. To the Ephesians, Paul wrote, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things the wrath of God comes on the disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Rather, put them to shame by your refusal to participate. In chapter 2, verse 16, Paul also says about Satan's mouthpieces, In this way they are heaping up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Beloved, listen, and God give you grace. It will not go well for those who do not repent for stirring up conflicts and controversies in the church. Paul said, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. When the enemy strikes back, what is his objective? Whom does he employ? How does he use them? And finally, you're ready for some good news. You ready for some victory this morning? Finally, when the enemy strikes back, how does Jesus help his church to overcome? Worship team, come help me. When the enemy strikes back, how does Jesus help his church to overcome? Can I tell you, it's not very fun to talk about Satan's opposition of the church. It's not fun to talk about his accomplices. It's not fun to talk about how he employs them nor their fate if they don't repent. But I want to tell you that it is necessary that we talk about it because the Bible talks about it. Do you know that God hasn't given us the luxury of only analyzing those portions of Scripture that appeal to us? We need the whole counsel of God. We need to digest it. We need to receive it. Yes. And I want to tell you it's helpful to talk about it, even if hard to hear. Paul says we are not ignorant of Satan's devices, lest he should take advantage of any of us. You see, by learning how the enemy works, we can more easily identify when he's working on us. But at the end of the day, Satan is not the subject of the scriptures. Jesus is. 
And 1 Thessalonians 2 and 3 are not about how bad Satan's opposition is, but about how glorious the church's triumph over it is. In spite of intense persecution from without and an attempt to discredit Paul from within, Timothy brought back a good report about a thriving, overcoming church. In fact, Paul says when he brought his report, it was gospel to my ears. When the enemy strikes back, how does Jesus help his church to overcome? Three things I want to give you quickly and we're done. These are three kingdom principles. Write them down and take them to the bank. How does Jesus help his church overcome? First of all, through the power of faith. Paul says, I sent Timothy to find out about your faith to strengthen and encourage your faith. And it was gospel to our ears when we heard about you that you're standing firm in your faith. Faith is critical because it keeps us from becoming shaken when there are shakeups in the church. Faith in God is what anchors us. It's what holds us steady when we're not sure what to think about men. Have faith in God who called you to be a member of his church through salvation in Jesus. Have faith in God who gives apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to prepare God's people and build up the body of Christ to the full measure of maturity. Have faith in the gospel which is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Have faith in the church the church is Christ's body. The church is Christ's bride. It will endure to the end and into all of eternity. You know what? I've read all the way. I skipped to the very end of the book. And I'll tell you what. Kings and their kingdoms, they are all gone. Governments and economies, they are all gone. But Jesus and his church are enduring for all of eternity. One thing that I've learned in my journey is that the church is a lot stronger than people think it is. The church is a lot more resilient than people think it is. It's a lot more flexible. It's a lot more adaptable. It's a lot more sustainable than people think it is because the church's survival doesn't depend upon the ability of human leaders, but it depends upon Jesus who said, I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. Have faith in Jesus, the head of the church who tests the hearts of all men and brings everything into his light. Have faith in the Holy Spirit who continues purifying and perfecting the people of God. When the enemy strikes back, this is the victory that overcomes even our faith in God. When the enemy strikes back, how does Jesus help his church to overcome? Second, through the power of love through the power of love. Turns out that muskrat love didn't hold the captain and Tennille together. You had to be over 40 to get that. But God's love is enough to hold his church together. Love is a theme that's threaded throughout Thessalonians. Chapters 2 and 3 are full of Paul's acts of love. Again and again, he made personal sacrifices out of his love for the congregation, tenderly pastoring them, working with his own hands night and day so as not to impose a burden on them. Although he was very shaky physically and shaky emotionally, staying in Athens all alone so that he could send Timothy back to them to strengthen and to encourage them. Beloved, that is how we always counter Satan's kingdom by acting in the opposite spirit. Rather than being overcome by evil, we overcome evil by doing good, by loving and the love of God. In addition to acts of love, I see Paul's apostolic prayers for more love. Can I tell you, the kind of love that holds the church together doesn't come through our own efforts to love or through a decision to be more loving on our part. The kind of love that holds the church together comes only from the Holy Spirit. It is released into the atmosphere of the church by the Holy Spirit. 
the last fire in the night, Pastor Ruth, around 10 o'clock in the evening. I just felt the Lord doing that again. My heart was just filled to overflowing with the love of God for his people. I was looking around the room at those that were there at that hour, and there was so much love in my heart. I loved him and him, her, her, him, him, her, and him. In the face of Satan's opposition, Paul countered by making intercession night and day for their love to increase. He wrote in chapter 3, verse 10, night and day, we pray most earnestly, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as our love overflows for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless in the presence of God when Jesus comes with his holy ones. When the enemy strikes back, how does Jesus help his church to overcome? Finally, through the power of honor. Through the power of honor. Satan's mouthpieces sowed seeds of doubt, but they failed to disaffect the Thessalonians from Paul. When Timothy came, Paul wrote, Timothy has told us how you have retained pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us as we long to see you. Now may God himself clear the way between us and you. Beloved, here's the final word that I have to share with you this morning from the Holy Spirit and we're done. Love the man and respect the office. When Satan sows seeds of doubt in the congregation, love the man and respect the office. Are apostolic and congregational leaders perfect? No way. Do we have weaknesses and make mistakes? You betcha. Paul said, now we see through a glass darkly. We know in part. We prophesy in part. He said, God has hidden his treasure in earthen vessels, clay pots. I like to call it cracked pots. Nevertheless, love the man and respect the office. Love the man with God's love. Desire to see God's work of perfecting grace continue in his life. And respect the office because it is an extension of God's own authority. Eli was a priest who had grown unfaithful to the Lord. He was so out of touch with the Holy Spirit that when Hannah came into the temple and she was pouring her heart out in prayer in anguish of spirit, Eli accused her of being drunk. He was an abusive priest. Yet Hannah still showed respect for his office. And because she did, God used Eli as the vehicle through which her request for a son was granted. And Hannah gave birth to Samuel, Eli's replacement. You see, if you love the man and you respect the office, God will give birth to something through you that will restore prophetic ministry and the glory of the presence of God in his church. Love the man and respect the office. In the closing words of 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes this. Now we ask you, brothers to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work, and live in peace with one another. What happens when the enemy strikes back? What's his objective? Whom does he employ? How does he use them? And how does Jesus help the church to overcome through the power of faith, through the power of love, and through the power of honor. May God give you grace to receive his word today. Would you stand on your feet and would you give Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place? Come on, you can do better than that. Let's give Jesus a great big praise. He's always worthy of all glory, of all honor, of all praise. Come on, let's sing, I trust in you. 
of worship we're going to share at the Lord's table. But just before we do, I just want to pray for you. If you would, would you just lift your face to the Lord? Would you just lift up your hands if you want? If Would you just lift up your hands to heaven? And let me just pray a prayer that the Lord put on my heart. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Now, Father, I pray that you would come and sanctify us by your word of truth. Father, I pray that you would forgive us for any way in which we may have partnered with Satan's opposition of your church, either by being unwitting mouthpieces ourselves or by giving any place to their words in our hearts. Father, we repent for any act of partnership with Satan's opposition. We renounce that partnership and we break that partnership now in the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus, I pray that you would come and wash us with pure water. Pray that you'd cleanse our hands, cleanse our hearts, cleanse our mouths, cleanse our minds. Jesus, I pray that you would undo whatever the enemy has done. I pray that you would remove any seeds of doubt and the unrighteous fruit that they have borne. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come and lavish the love of God in our hearts. I pray that you would increase our love more and more and that it would overflow to one another and to all men. Father, I thank you for the palpable love of God that dwelt for so many years at Jesus Focus Ministry. And I pray that Harvest Time Church would far surpass that measure of love. Father, I pray that as we honor the offices of ministry out of reverence for you, that you would enable us to give birth to something that restores the prophetic voice, prophetic ministry, and the glory of God's presence to his church. Father, we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone who is in agreement said, Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord one more offering of praise in this place. God bless you, everyone. For our final act of worship, we're going to share at the Lord's table. If you're a believer in Jesus, we invite you to share at this table with us. In just a moment, we're going to ask you to leave your seat. Come down the center aisle. Receive. The Apostle Paul wrote to the believers in Corinth, I received from the Lord what I pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's give thanks for the bread. Father, we thank you so much that you loved us so much that you gave Jesus your only son. Father, thank you that his body was broken so that we might be made whole in every way, whole in our innermost being, whole in our emotions, whole in our thought processes, whole in our decision making, whole in our relationships, whole in our soul, and whole in our bodies as well. Father, I thank you that healing is the children's bread. And Father, I pray even as we receive in the presence of God this morning, as we receive physical bread, I pray that we'd receive the grace of healing, Lord, that you'd heal bodies all over this room. Father, I thank you that Jesus' body was broken so that we who were not a people could now become the people of God, the body of Christ. Father, I pray that while we receive this bread, you would release in our midst the beautiful unity of the Holy Spirit in the bond of peace. I pray that you'd lavish the love of God in our hearts. Father, I pray that you'd make us one, even as the Father and the Son are one as we partake together of the one loaf, Jesus, and everyone in agreement said, amen. Let's receive the bread. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just celebrate Jesus in your hearts, would you? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Paul continues in the same way after supper. Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's give thanks for the cup. Father, thank you that we have been redeemed, not by perishable things like gold or silver, but by the precious blood of Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God. Though our sins were as scarlet, you've washed us whiter than snow. Thank you for your promise that says, if we sin, we have an advocate with you, Jesus, the righteous one. And that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, now by faith in the cross of Jesus Christ, we receive everything purchased for us on Calvary. In the name of our great Savior, Jesus, everyone whose heart agrees said, Amen. Let's receive the cup together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Come on, would you just celebrate Jesus for one moment more? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord. Thank you, Father. The ushers are coming and they're going to pass a container down.